first off, we start with the mission of the uh, MD CREZ chapter, which is to support a 100% renewable Colorado through education, engagement, and connection to networking opportunities across all Denver communities. We value renewables, emerging technologies, efficiency, diversity, inclusion, and community. CREZ is a statewide, nonpartisan, nonprofit, 501c3 membership organization. So what to expect tonight, we're starting with our announcement, and then in a few minutes, we will be launching into our feature presentation, as well as a question and answer session. <clears throat> First off, I encourage everybody here to become a member. You can do that on www.cres-energy.org. <clears throat> and if you have feedback for us, please, we want to hear from you. Now you can share it at mdcrez at crez-energy.org. Don't forget to change your Amazon Smile charity to CREZ. Every purchase you make through Amazon will help to support us and our mission and our ability to provide you with events like these. And it is the 25th anniversary of CREZ, so when you are becoming a member, uh, use the promo code CREZ25 at the checkout, um, <clears throat> and you will save 25% off on your annual membership. And because we are transitioning to FlipCause as a membership platform, even if you think you have been an annual member, you might want to double check and just make sure that you've made that transition over to the new system. We really uh, appreciate you doing so. Exciting announcement for our members and others in the Denver community. Uh, Denver has launched its third solar co-op, and it's effectively a group purchase program where Denver residents can save money by going solar, effectively all get together and put out a request for proposals to local installers, asking them you know, what kind of deal can they get, as well as what sort of local community impact do they make, and other benefits uh, can they provide. As part of this co-op, there's also a solar equity rebate program that for income qualified residents can provide up to $3,000 uh, off of their solar array, an additional 2,000 to support battery storage um, as well. You can go to solarunitedneighbors.org slash CREZ uh, for more information. Make sure to mention CREZ as your referral source as that uh, provides CREZ with a small fee that helps to support our mission. And we're really trying to make sure that this co-op has something for everyone. Even if solar isn't right for you, they can help you evaluate options like community solar, as well as other income qualified program offerings for free energy efficiency services, things like bill payment assistance and appliance repla replacements that are funded by Denver's Office of Nonprofit Engagement. So be sure to join the uh, co-op and learn more about this exciting opportunity. We have a few other upcoming events that we encourage you to join us at. Uh, next month, Thursday, October 21st, will be a panel discussing ESG, which you may have heard that acronym, but always wondered, well, what does that actually mean? It's environmental, social, and governance, which has increasingly become a trend across corporate America and a priority for investors. Our speakers will discuss how different corporations and investors are tackling ESG and what the future uh, and what that future looks like. And then in November, we're very excited to have Dr. Nikki Roy, who is a member of Representative Diane DeGette's uh, congressional team and is her aide for energy policy and will be talking to Chris about Biden's infrastructure plan. Uh, so come learn from Dr. Roy, who has experience with cap and trade programs in Congress and has been a key part of Representative De uh, DeGette's energy proposals and Hopefully, we'll be telling us about this uh, exciting opportunity being led at the federal level. And with that, I'm excited to launch us straight into our speaker series uh, for tonight, our annual policy night with Senator Chris Hansen and Representative uh, Tracy Burnett. And I am Johnny Rogers. I am the uh, policy chair for the Metro Denver chapter of the Colorado Renewable Energy Society and also the Renewable Energy Specialist for the City and County of Denver. So let me stop sharing my screen here and bring Representative Burnett and Senator Hanson into the conversation now. 
So Senator Hansen represents Colorado's Senate District 31 in Denver. He is the chair of the Appropriation Committee and serves on the Joint Budget Committee. He's been a featured guest for CRES before, and we are very excited to have him back for another conversation. And Representative Tracy Burnett represents House Dish District 12 in Boulder. She serves on three committees, including the Energy and Environment, State, Civic, Military, and Veterans Affairs, and the Joint Technology Committee. Tracy, Tracy was a freshman legislator, having been elected to represent District 12 in 2020. And she certainly made a mark in her first legislative session, and we're excited to welcome her to CRES's annual policy night. This is also Tracy's fourth speaking engagement of the day, including a talk at the New York Climate Week this morning. So first, Tracy, how are you feeling? How are you doing? Well, uh, in the past, I've run uh, 36 marathons, and I'd say that this is about mile 22, but I'm doing fine. I've got a lot of cheerleaders, I'm sure, in the crowd, so I'm doing well. Thank you. Good, very glad to hear it, and glad to have you here. And Chris, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you're doing well also. Yeah, having a, having a, a long day myself. With uh, We had Joint Budget Committee all day today, so this is a nice uh, nice break from budget policy to join everybody with Chris, at Chris. Great, well, thank you both for being here. And Tracy, you mentioned to me that uh, there'd be a recording of the talk that you gave at the New York Climate Week. Uh, do you wanna kind of let everybody know where they might be able to find that? Oh boy, I don't have that right at my, my fingertips. I'm gonna to have to uh, pass it out to you. Uh, so uh, yeah, it was all about uh, a bill that I'd have to give credit to Senator Hansen for the idea. It's a buy clean Colorado bill. Uh, he tried to get over the finish line last, uh, uh, last session and uh, COVID shut it down. So I was very excited to take it on and get it, get it over the finish line with Senator Hansen's help this year. So buy clean Colorado. In fact, we'll talk about it tonight. So um, I will get you that information later on, okay? Okay, fantastic. And we'll make sure to get that out to, to our members and look forward to talking about it tonight. Uh, so first, before we jump into some of the legislative uh, accomplishments of this past year, um, we'd welcome you to each, you know, share a little bit more with our members about your background, your district, and what inspired you to either first run or keep running for office. Either want to jump at that first? Chris, you can start. Sure, sure happy to. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I guess a little bit about my background and, and my district. So Senate District 31 is basically from the capital in Denver down to the tech center and is the east and southeast uh, quadrant of, of Denver and a little bit of Arapahoe County and, and Glendale. Um, I, you know, really decided uh, to, I kind of had a burn the ships moment, as I often say, where I left my job. I was working at IHS uh, and, and doing research on electricity markets and renewable energy projects all around the world and decided I, it was time to leave my job and started knocking doors in 2015 uh, and really ran for office because I wanted to work on climate change. It was the, the reason uh, I, I got involved in politics and uh, you know knocked on doors of all of 15 and 16 and was successful in running for the state house and then came over to the state senate in 2020 and then won a full year, a full four year term uh, last election. And you know a little bit about my background. I started off as a nuclear engineer. I then uh, went to grad school at MIT uh, for an engineering systems degree in, in technology policy, uh, and then did uh, a PhD in energy economics uh, over at the University of Oxford, and then came back and started my professional career with with IHS. So that's a, a little bit about my background. And and so the it, you know the clean energy, clean tech, uh, decarbonization. I mean these are these are the things that are top of mind for me every single session, uh, you know, do six or seven bills per session on, on these topics and really pleased to have Rep Burnett now in the house. Uh, we, we teamed up on a, on a large slate of bills this year, which uh, many of them we'll get to talk about uh, this evening. Um, and it's just such a pleasure to do this work and, and I appreciate you including me tonight, Johnny. <laughs> All right, thank you, Chris and Rep Burnett. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I always introduce myself as a mom, an engineer, an entrepreneur, and a world-class runner. Uh, but I have to, I, I, I so enjoy working with uh, Senator Hansen because, well, he's MIT and Oxford. I have an engineering degree from Cornell and a Harvard MBA. So we, we, we kind of, you know, 
people say, you know, who's the smarter one? Well, we keep on hearing each other is so. <laughs> but it's really so much fun to work with another engineer and and uh, you know have bills that are in the Senate go over to the House and vice versa. But um, my my background is um, I have worked in uh, the construction industry. I used to design. Uh, nuclear power plants, do earthquake design and nuclear power plants. And then I worked in uh, garbage to energy systems of all things, then in the aerospace defense industry, and then in the computer industry. And actually I hit the glass ceiling. I was working for a Fortune 50 company. I hit the glass ceiling. I broke through it and said to heck with that. And I started my own consulting business in the computer industry. I was an industry analyst in the computer industry. I've been retired for a while and then I decided to jump into this craziness. Um, for um, not only because it, it sounds kind of Pollyannish, but I do want to make the world a better place. But there's a couple, three things that really happened that really uh, inspired me to really work on environmental um, uh, legislation. Um, my son nearly died of an asthma attack when he was two, the worst day of my life. And I had to take him to the ER multiple times after that because of the climate change induced wildfires right here on the front range. Um, I, I mentioned I'm a world-class runner. Um, actually, in 2019, I was number one in the world in the indoor mile in my age group. But I have asthma. And well, as most people, when they go out and exercise, they check the weather, I have to check the ozone level. Um, and I've had to scrap a number of workouts because of the horrific ozone problem we have here in the front range. And the other thing is a, a, a good friend of mine nearly died in the floods that hit Boulder County in 2013, where the St. Brain River jumped its banks, cut a new path right through the, her house, and uh, she nearly died. And so those are the reasons I'm running. And just one other thing, I, I do represent House District 12, which is Eastern Boulder County. So uh, I, I mirror what uh, Senator Hansen has already said, you know, energy, environment, those are, those are the main reasons I'm running. I ran for office. So thank you. No, thank you. And, and thanks so much for that story. That's really inspiring. So let's jump in now and talk a little bit about where we are. Uh, so Chris, you provided a, a couple slides here that might help set the stage for kind of where Colorado is in terms of our uh, kind of greenhouse gas emissions um, situation. I'm going to just go through the first four slides here if you want to talk us through them. Yeah, sounds great. I, I love to start with this slide. This is actually a picture from the Eastern Plains, uh, Rush Creek Wind Farm uh, that is owned and operated by Excel, which is probably most of the folks on the phone as is our provider. Um, but this is a moment of tremendous change and if we can can really carefully manage that and help guide it uh, help accelerate it um we have you know just like half a chance left uh to to do something about climate change our time is running out very quickly uh and and we need to move fast um this is an existential threat uh you know the the problems that tracy mentioned with air quality are, are kind of the unfortunately the tip of the iceberg uh, so to speak, or the, the melted iceberg, as it were. Um, so I'd love to start with this, you know, this uh, quote and this this picture. If you go on to the next slide, you can see uh, kind of where we are as far as statutory requirements. We have a 2025 target that is essentially equal to the Paris Accord, uh, 25, 26% reduction, 50% uh, economy-wide decarbonization by 2030, and then a 2050 target of 90%. Um, I am of the opinion that our 2050 target is not adequate. I think we're going to need to move faster uh, and really get to net zero by 2040, I think, is, is the goal that we need to be modeling and working toward right now. Uh, and so that, that may be something you see on uh, the legislative docket uh, here, here soon, because um, I think we need to do a bit better than, than these current targets. Um, well, significantly better, let's put it that way. Uh, as you go on to the next slide, this gives everybody a snapshot of the emissions in the state. Uh, this is a pre-COVID 2019 kind of snapshot. I, I, I would say that on the right-hand side of the graph, we have a pretty good sense of how we're going to get to these targets. I would say it gets much more difficult on the left-hand side of this graph. And so one of the things that, that Tracy and I worked on last year was to not only continue to make progress on electric power and vehicle electrification, but working on things like beneficial electrification, clean heat, uh, buy clean, 
all of the things uh, that are uh, tougher to decarbonize on the left-hand side of this graph. And so you'll see that theme continue to emerge as we talk about uh, you know, recent past as well as future legislation is we've got to really accelerate our work on that left-hand side. And then I think, is there one more you wanted to show? Um, uh, we're going to stop it? here for That's now because okay. the next one uh, will take us away from, from this topic. But first, okay. electric power uh, is where I want to start our, our conversation and specifically uh, Senate Bill 21-072. The Public Utilities Commission modernized electric transmission uh, infrastructure calls for all Colorado transmission utilities to join an organized wholesale market uh, by 2030. And we actually have a, a couple slides here on this bill that, that I'll pull up and, and kind of ask you the question as, as you walk through this, you know, what is an organized wholesale market and why is this uh, so important? Yeah, well, I, I really saw this as one of these um, uh, really critical measures that was not getting the attention that it needed over the last 10 years. And that is that we have an outdated grid. We have a grid that is not well connected with our neighbors. And if the situation in Texas back in February teaches us anything is you really need uh, good interconnection with your neighbors. Uh, many problems in Texas, lots of different facets to the emergency that they, they suffered, the outages they suffered. But one of the key drivers there was that ERCOT is a total island in the grid, and they had almost no capacity to bring in help from the outside when they when they were short of power. And so that's what we want to avoid in Colorado. And so this is our moment to not only increase reliability, uh, increase resiliency, but also uh, inside of a, a wholesale market or an RTO or ISO, as it's sometimes known, um, it allows the, the grid to decarbonize at a much uh, faster rate and a much more efficient way. Uh, rate for the for the rate payers. Um, and so the, the bill uh, created a deadline for that of 2030. It also created a transmission authority uh, to do projects uh, in the places where the utilities can't or won't really fill in some of the transmission deserts that we have. Um, you know, it's it's almost the equivalent of like your your town not being on the railroad back in 1880. You were going to you know be bypassed. You weren't going to have a chance for economic uh, expansion. Um, economic opportunity is going to follow the grid. And we have got places in Southeast Colorado in San Luis Valley uh, that are just bereft of transmission. And this uh, CETA is really designed to help address that quickly. And then the final thing the bill does is just lays out very clear timelines for uh, permitting and evaluation of, of new transmission projects. And so in this way, we hope to really strengthen Colorado's grid uh, and allow us to do microgrids and more distributed energy and larger solar and wind installations um, as well as start to share with our neighbors because there's kind of a match made in heaven. If you, uh, I think on the next slide, you can kind of see the match made in heaven uh, between, you know, the parts of the grid where there's lots of renewables uh, is, is pretty weak. And then there's lots of demand uh, on the coasts and in the big cities. We need to match those up. And that's what uh, Senate Bill 72 is really designed to do is get us into a strong regional grid and take advantage of that purple area. We've got great wind, we have great solar, we just gotta have a way to get it to market. And that's that was really the intent of Senate Bill 72. And, and I'll just pipe in, um, I didn't partner with uh, Senator Hansen on this bill, but I was. I, I did uh, hear it in, uh, in the House Committee on Energy and Environment. I was absolutely thrilled to see this bill. Um, it's so needed and I look at this as, um, as a start. This is a great start but there's so much more we need to do. One of the things I just have to mention that I, I really like too, is that this included the ability to do broadband alongside those lines, if I'm not mistaken. And again, this is another part of the infrastructure that we really need. Um, but, um, you know, I, I've done um, some, I've gone to conferences and things like that this summer. And one of the things that really stuck with me is the most reliable, most cost-effective grid is a combination of utility grade um, ge electric generation and microgrids. And so this is that first step in this. This is one area uh, that I'm very interested in continuing to, um, to work on. And uh, if I could just put a little future out there, one of the things that really gets me excited is um, this SEAM study that um, I've uh, listened to uh, presentations that, that NREL has done. And this is sort of out in the future, but it's basically DC-DC transmission uh, between these regional developments. 
And even in that scene study, it's showing that renewables as part of that grid, those, those smaller uh, renewable you know, microgrids and things like that, is the most cost-effective and most reliable system for the entire nation. So uh, uh, kudos to Senator Hansen for really uh, bringing this forward and getting it passed. Fantastic. Thanks for those comments. And, and Tracy, you already started getting into kind of my follow-up question for you all is, this transmission is uh, really important to building out a more dynamic and regional approach to grid management and sharing resources. But, you know, what does the future of the grid look like? And what is that vision that you both have for how the large resources and distributed resources and other technologies like demand response systems or managed electric vehicle char charging can come together to create that grid of the future? What, what do you see as uh, potentially the balance of, of resources and where we should be focusing our attention. Well, I would just say to kick that discussion off, I, I think it's really a, a both and type of future. I think we're going to need uh, very robust uh, intercontinental RTO. I think, you know, regionalization is great, but ultimately, and I think in our lifetimes, we're going to have an intercontinental grid because it just works better for everybody if you do that. And our control technology has improved so much. And I think in or inside of that, you're going to see some big DC uh, lines that are going to link regions um, and really fill in the gaps uh, from the AC system. And then the final uh, piece of that is going to be a, a robust set of microgrids that, that help uh, increase resiliency on the local level and, and allow for further integration of renewables. So I, I think we're going to be able to very quickly get to 90 plus percent uh, on renewables. Um, as those grids improve, you'll be able to tick up uh, even higher. Um, and there's just going to be a very small residual that we're going to need, you know, geothermal or, uh, you know, zero carbon uh, uh, turbines, uh, maybe using hydrogen ammonia as, as a way to get that last increment of decarbonization. Uh, pumped hydro and, and other battery technology, of course, will be an important part of that, that puzzle. Um, but that's where I think we're headed uh, over the next 20, 30 years is intercontinental grid, uh, more DC enterprise and uh, a lot of microgrids uh, sitting underneath that. I'd also just like to mention, I think that we're going to need to change, um, I don't want to say consumer behavior, but we have to we have to make the grid smarter uh, for uh, individual users, uh, homes and cars and things like that. So, um, you know, I'm sure you all are aware of the duck curve and how we manage that. So it's going to take some demand management, too. And so this is something uh, that will, uh, you know, I'm very interested in learning more about and seeing how as a legislator I can help move that forward yeah i just quickly to tag on to that i would say i just uh would throw out the concept of dispatchable load we talk a lot about dispatchable electricity sources i think that's an increasingly moot concept uh given the future that we're all looking at but i think there is a really powerful dynamic around dispatchable loads so you know one small example is you charge your ev overnight um, but you start adding on uh, electric furnaces, electric HVAC equipment, commercial buildings, beneficial electrification, adding lots of new, you know, internet connected devices that can cycle on and off as they get the right price signal. And I think all of that's going to be automated over time. And, you know, we'll have fleets of automated EVs that will just plug in and charge whenever there's excess electricity. Um, and then, of course, you've got excess uh, dispatchable load from, you know, it might be uh, Bitcoin mining. Uh, uh, it might be. Uh, hydrogen and ammonia production of the future where you can cycle those on and off as you have the right price signal. So uh, dispatchable load is going to be a huge part of, of managing the grid in the future. I'd, I'd say also one of the things to keep in mind too is like who owns the data, who owns the information associated with these, this demand and supply, this demand cycle. So just want to throw that out there as a, another thought that we have to keep in mind. Absolutely. Thanks for all those comments and, and really exciting to be thinking about uh, all the different opportunities that the future grid presents to us and all the different technologies and tools that hopefully we'll be able to work with. But uh, the next topic I want to go into is, is all about equity and you know, working for the city as a big focus of our program design and our thought on public policy. It's really making sure that you know, as we're reducing emissions, we're ensuring that you know, the economic, environmental, and you know, social and other benefits of this transition are really being shared to the fullest possible extent with the community 
and with a particular emphasis on those that have been disproportionately impacted by climate change or where you know, fossil fuel plants or industrial activity uh, has occurred. Uh, so the first bill here, you know, Senate Bill 21-272, measures to modernize uh, the Public Utilities Commission. Some really exciting provisions in it uh, to dedicate up to 40% of the RESA, the Renewable Energy Standard Adjustment Expenditures, so things on renewable energy and distributed um, renewable uh, investments, to address historical shortfalls and benefits to low-income customers and to disproportionately impacted communities as well as uh, other considerations by the commission to adopt rules and, and require uh, these important considerations on how their decisions can improve equity for and minimize impacts on uh, these disproportionately impacted communities. Um, so tell me a little bit about, about this bill and you know, how do you think it will really help to center equity as a focus in the future of the grid? Yeah, I, you know, Senate Bill 272 was kind of a, a major modernization effort for the PUC. We, over the over the last several years, have given the PUC a pretty long to-do list, uh, and we really needed to respond, uh, you know, to the 19, the 20, the 21 legislation by making sure they had the resources and the guidance to really uh, execute and carry out, uh, you know, the big policy changes that we've made, which you know we've talked about over the over the years, and can, and you know, Senate Bill 72 is another example. There's your your need transmission experts to, to implement that bill, uh, clean heat bill that we did. We we're going to need experts to do that. And so we added uh, some flexibility on the budget side so that they could hire up and, and get the staff they needed outside consultants, make sure the commissioners are supported. But Johnny, I really appreciate you mentioning the other important part of that bill, um, which is to make sure there are dedicated funds uh, to address equity issues in the way that we address uh, energy policy. And it's not good enough just to decarbonize or, or you know, get rid of pollution in a broad way. We need to do it in a way that responds to the, the past inequity and, and addressing the, the shortcomings of, of how we've operated in the past. And, and we gave the PUC some very specific instructions on that. We made sure, as you said, that 40 percent of the RESA is going to get spent on helping disproportionately impacted communities. Um, so that we, we start to correct for those past uh, imbalances and inequity. Uh, so yeah, really proud to get 272, uh, you know, to, across the, you know, to the governor's desk and, and now it's law of Colorado. Yeah, and, and I just have to say that um, this is one of the bills I partnered with Senator Hansen on and uh, I, I can't emphasize enough what he's already said. I think a lot of the bills that we have uh, that we got passed this year have an equity component, both in terms of disproportionately impacted communities as well as uh, people who are income qualified. And uh, and just some of the bills that that were affected by SB 272 were funded that have an equity component. Is uh, I look at the the Office of Consumer Counsel. This is this is uh, I don't know if you know anything about that, but basically. Um, it's it's for residents. It's it's a um, an, an office that advocates before the PUC for residents and small businesses, and I think that has a, a real equity component. Um, beneficial electrification was another bill funded by that. There's a big equity component of that, as well as um, the clean heat bill. Um, but one of the things that we popped in at the last minute in the last few uh, days of session was House Bill 1266, and this is specifically um, uh, designed for um, addressing uh, disproportionately impacted communities and what that really means. And so there's a lot of work at the last minute to make sure that that bill really fit with SB2, SB2 um, SB 272. And um, House Bill 1266, it creates an environmental justice ombuds person, I can't quite say that, and an advisory board to the CEPHG. And um, it, I mean, it just, it's just a tremendous bill. So um, I was really glad that we were able to slip that one in and really get that one funded too. Yeah, thank, thank you for bringing that one up and that's a, a good transition for us. But before we, we jump into some of the other great parts of 1266, uh, there was a bill that was getting a lot of attention, Senate Bill 21-200, which was, you know, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase environmental justice. Um, it directed the AQCC to implement rules to achieve statewide reductions of GHGs, including setting specific net emission weight limits for various emission sectors and allowing for the use of a multi-sector program to do so, something like cap and trade, for instance. 
Um, it had called for that creation of the environmental justice ombudsperson and the environmental justice advisory board, but it was met with a veto threat and the bill ultimately did not pass and had to be broken apart and, and those elements brought into some of the other legislation that you worked on. So I guess, can you I, give your assessment? I'll why why didn't, <laughs> all right, the jump, jump right in. Tell me, it's tell me about good. this bill, its history and, and how we got to where we did. You know, in the last uh, three se uh, three days of uh, session, uh, Rep. Burnett was working or work working like crazy. Um, and I put it very simply, uh, SB 200 was looking to do, uh, looking at five different sec sectors. We've got oil and gas, uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, oil and gas, um, uh, electric utilities, industrial processes, transportation, and buildings. And in those in those five sectors, what it was really designed to do was to measure greenhouse gases, make it equitable, you know, in infecting and uh, disproportionately impacted communities, and also enforceable. And what happened in the last few se few days of um, session is three of those sectors were folded into House Bill 1266. And this is why it's so important that, that SB 272, that's why it was so important to get that over the line because it included funding for 1266. So it did take care of, uh, so 1266 includes uh, requiring the electric utilities to, to file clean heat energy plans with the PUC, requiring an 80% reduction from 2005 levels by 2030. And um, the AQCC can adopt rules if that plan does not meet target. It also requires the AQCC to establish a fee on greenhouse gas emissions and adopt rules to uh, limit greenhouse gas emissions in two other sectors. The oil and gas sector, a 36% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions compared to 2005 levels by 2025 and a 60% by 2030. And also in the manufacturing and industrial sector, 20% uh, below 2015 levels by 2030 and um, tradable greenhouse gas, a uh, tradable greenhouse gas program. So uh, a lot of SB, and, and I'm gonna put in one more plug because this is something that Senator Hansen got over the finish line last minute. Clean heat, that got us the fourth sector. So the only thing left is transportation. So um, I, I'd have to, you know, oh. got a lot done. <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll say, and that's, go ahead, Chris. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, it, it really was. I mean, we, we had a big session in 19. Uh, I think we, we upped the ante in 21. Uh, we got a, got a tremendous amount done. And, and I would say, you know, I, I, I always love to start with sort of the carbon emission supply graph. You know, where are emissions coming and how much is it going to cost to get rid of each of the sectors or different types of emissions? And, you know, that, that pie chart we looked at earlier, we made a bunch of progress on a whole bunch of different parts of that. And I think, you know, that's a little bit of the setup for next year and the year after is that we haven't done much yet on the ag sector, um, uh, which I think is ripe for a lot of progress. And a couple of the bills that I've, I've started working on for next year uh, are, are to, to do sectoral planning for the ag sector um, and figure out how we can marry, uh, you know, solar and ag together. It's a, sometimes referred to as agrivoltaics. Uh, in fact, there's a, one of the first ones in the state is in Tracy's district. Uh, uh, called Jack's Solar Garden. If you haven't been out there, I highly encourage it. Uh, Tracy and I, I think have both been a couple, couple few times ourselves, and that's an area that I think is really ripe for Colorado too. So, uh, lots of progress, but you know, the, the job is not even close to done, uh, given the urgency and the, and the amount of decarbonization we still have to go. And and so, successful year, uh, but just another step. Yeah, and I just have to put in a plug for agrivoltaics. I am so excited about this. Uh, this is, um, to me, what really is important, interesting is, is uh, the solar panels are raised a little bit higher and you can uh, graze cattle under there, raise crops, and that microclimate improves the soil health, the soil water retention. And so there's an increase in crop yields as much as 30% in tomatoes and that cooler microclimate also cools the solar panels and they get a one to two percent uh, improvement in efficiency and not only that you know if you think about all the farmers and ranchers who are uh, you know in the past have relied on maybe uh, fracked oil and gas 
this is something this is a way of sustaining their that their their um their their farms not only uh to uh, produce power for their farming operations but also to be able to uh, uh, um, sell these on, not on the open market, well, I won't get into details on that, but basically they have ex excess um, um, energy that they can then um, supplement their income. And especially as climate change continues, drought, these are the kind of things that we really need to pay, pay attention to. So I'm really excited about agrivoltaics. I, I wasn't expecting it, but this is a great opportunity to plug some of the work I'm doing in Denver where we're actually running a community solar program. We're planning on our first 10 projects being built next year as predominantly covered parking in uh, things like rec centers and school parking lots. But the projects that we're submitting to Excel Energy for approval this cycle is an agrivoltaics project out at the Denver Botanic Gardens Chatfield Farms site. So in partnership with NREL and Botanic Gardens, uh, hoping to donate up to 80% or more of that power to low-income housing. And then uh, Denver Botanic Gardens will be running a uh, kind of veterans in farming training program at that site and donating the food to local food banks and just using that as a another educational opportunity on, on the potential that this could uh, bring to the state and beyond. So fingers crossed we're, we're successful with that application. Uh, we need to get some approvals from the Army Corps of Engineers who actually own the land that the Botanic Gardens is sited on. So I may have to reach out to you both to provide a letter of support to help <laughs> help us out there. But uh, no, really, really exciting uh, hearing about everything you're able to get into 1266. Um, and we'll, we'll jump onto some other bills now. But I, I just want to comment on how I think 19-1264, which first set Colorado's greenhouse gas reduction targets, you know, as impactful as that was, I think it was incredible to really put that stake in the ground of getting that common agreement of recognizing climate change, the need to lower our emissions and saying, these are the targets we need to hit. And, you know, we're going to figure out how to do it later. You know, a couple of years go by and we come back and now we're starting to see, you know, these sectoral focus on, okay, well, here, here's what we need to do to actually hit these targets that we've all agreed that we need to get to. So just seeing this process start to unfold really gives me a lot of hope for you know, where we started, the progress we've already made, and hopefully now really getting these rules in place to regulate these different sectors and, and make sure that we're successful in hitting these, uh, hitting these goals. So bringing back up this um, GHG emissions chart here, you know, we've talked about electric power, but now looking at the left side of this graph is, is what we were starting to get into. Um, and first, I want to go into the uh, natural gas and methane, uh, particularly. So these were uh, a couple slides that you had shared. Chris, I don't know if there's anything that you want to talk about on the methane emissions by source before I flip over to Senate Bill 264. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate the focus on this. I mean, I, I think you know, again, we were looking at kind of the carbon supply curve and where could we decarbonize and make most rapid progress. And, and methane um, arguably is sort of a 50x multiplier of CO2 as far as damage to the environment. Um, you know, if you use a 50-year model, it's it's about 50x. If you use a 100-year model, it's about 25 times as potent. Um, and I, I really, I mean, I, I think for us to survive as a species, we need to, to have peak warming sometime around 2060. Uh, at the very latest. And so I think we need to start looking at methane in that kind of 50X multiplier. Um, and this is the snapshot from 2015. This is the latest data that we have from the department on where those emissions are coming from in Colorado. So we gotta work backwards from that. Um, we have made some progress in oil and gas. I think that number is, is lower today, um, but some of these other areas, uh, not a lot of, of movement. Um, and so I think the clean heat bill was really designed to try to uh, go after a lot of these uh, fugitive methane sources uh, and provide a really clear pathway and incentive to, to take care of them. And so here's kind of a graph in 2020, we're at, at about uh, you know 70 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent from the natural gas sector, and now really trying to push that down over time. So a 5% reduction by, by mid decade, and then another 22 or total of 22% reduction target by 2030. And those are in statute, those are binding targets, and 
we have now a very clear sectoral plan in Senate Bill 264. So, you know, it was kind of what you saw, you know, in our discussion of Senate Bill 200, so these overarching uh, target bills, but underneath that, we, we've got to do the hard yards, the hard work of, of these sectoral bills, and 264 is one example of that. Um, it incorporated the, you know, the DSM and the beneficial electrification, so those both count toward uh, hitting that 22% goal. So I think it did a nice job of, of bringing together different uh, ways to get there, very uh, flexible in that sense, uh, to hit the target, and we'll we'll do the you know the cheapest options first, of course, uh, as as we as we work to the 2030 target. I just have to say, this is another bill that I was really pleased to partner with uh, Senator Hansen on. And when I first read it, I know he worked really hard to get this uh, over to the House. And when I read it, I all I could say is it's brilliant. Uh, it is a fabulous plan. Uh, it really gives the Public Utilities uh, Commission a lot of authority and direction to consider all aspects that we need to uh, what I call uh, crack this hardest nut. Buildings are the hardest nut to crack in terms of decarbonizing, and it will take the longest time to do so. And I look at this bill as an overarching bill under which the tools like gas demand side management and beneficial electrification fit. And so it's just a fabulous bill. Um, and I was so proud to be a part of it. Great. And then the, the other bill uh, on this vein is 21-1238, uh, Public Utilities Commission modernized uh, gas utility demand side management standards, which you know updates uh, the cost effectiveness test used to determine uh, which um, you know, DSM measures can be implemented for gas utilities. It increases the social cost of carbon for CO2 from $46 to $68, and also includes uh, a social cost of methane, not less than $1,756 a ton, <clears throat> which is incredible to finally have that uh, accounted for as something that we need to be aware of. So you know, how, how do you see these and you've already talked about this a little bit, but you know, how do these two bills really help transition our dependence off of natural gas? Well, I'll, I'll start with this because, again, this is a bill that I know that uh, Senator Hansen and Senator Foote, who uh, is no longer in office, I, I was following this, uh, you know, the idea of it, and boy, I heard about social costs of methane, and and I, 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 I lobbied hard to make this my first bill. I couldn't pick a more complicated bill as my first bill, um, but I'm so glad uh, that uh, that I was able to get on part of it. And I have to say, it's not just a, it's not just the social costs of of carbon dioxide and methane, but it's also the discount rate. It gets a little you know bit technical here, but the discount rate, the lower the discount rate for future benefits the more those future benefits of not using, um, of not burning carbon dioxide, not using methane, not leaking methane, uh, really promote and encourage um, the gas utilities to, uh, to do programs that improve energy efficiency and, and help us transition toward clean heat technology. So um, I, I just, uh, I don't know if I want to say anything more of it, I, I, you know, but I, I do have to say something. Um, you know, it's really important that we don't forget that energy efficiency is going to get us a long way toward uh, where we want to get uh, in terms of climate change. And I've heard as high as 50% of the effort should go toward renewable, I mean, toward um energy efficiency. This is a gas energy efficiency bill, but it also is technology neutral. And so it does foster um, transitioning to clean heat technologies over time. But in the short term, it saves uh, Coloradans about six to seven hundred million dollars in energy savings, gas energy savings over the next uh, you know, 10 years. So it's a pretty good bill. So. Oh, absolutely. And I think one of the things that I've heard is pushback from efforts to you know, invest in clean heat, uh, specifically for things like biogas or green hydrogen um, for those difficult to electrify uses, is that, you know, is that just perpetuating some dependence on natural gas? Uh, so how do we make sure that 
you know, we have the resources that we need to continue to you know, sustain our economy and society and make this transition without locking ourselves into uh, unintended consequences of some of these technology, technologies or some continued re reliance on fossil fuels. How, how does this kind of come together with some of the other work that you're doing? And I'll, I'll take a little crack at that, and, uh, and, and Senator Hansen, I know you'll have a lot more to say, but to me, uh, this, you know, when we talk about gas, it's natural gas, it's methane, it, that's what we use to heat our homes, that's what we use to heat our water, that's what we heat, uh, use to heat our food. And so I think a lot of it starts right here in the home and in our businesses that we use, and we start use, uh, incentivizing uh, induction cook stoves you know, energy efficiency, uh, space and water heaters. You know, if, you, if, you're, if your AC goes out, put in a heat pump instead. Think about that. If you are remodeling your house, think about uh, the benefits of a heat pump because it uses, the heat pump technology does not use the same ductwork. So if you're building a new house, think about um, pre-wiring it for EV and for heat pump technology. So some of it, these are the, use a smart thermostat. These are kind of things that, that individuals and businesses can do, but the programs that we're putting in place, the gas DSM, the electric, uh, beneficial electrification, all those things help incentivize doing that. So I think it really comes down to, we need to, we need to decrease the, we need to decrease and eventually, you know, get rid of the demand for, for, for uh, methane. So do you want to pipe in there, <laughs> Chris? Yeah, uh, that's, that's the right metaphor, pipes. Um, I really, I think, uh, just want to add that, uh, you know, the, the, this perpetuation argument, I think, is focusing on the wrong thing. The, the rate payers of the state of Colorado and, and around the world have uh, paid billions of dollars for pipes. Um, let's start thinking about how do we use the assets that we have in a way to help accelerate decarbonization. So to me, uh, green hydrogen and uh, green ammonia, so using renewable electricity to create those products, um, and then utilizing the pipes that we've already paid for to deliver those energy products as a way to decarbonize some very difficult applications, um, which we're all familiar with, um, makes a ton of sense. Now, if we've got a steady improvement in heat pumps and they are a better option for people, fantastic. There are going to be some industrial processes, though, where um, kind of a, a, a nitrogen hydrogen mix is going to be the best way to decarbonize them and delivery of those fuels uh, is most likely going to make sense using the pipes that we already have in place so uh, you know I, I don't I don't really get the perpetuation argument I think if we stay focused on uh, decarbonization if we make it very clear what the targets are and the and we have clear price signals that we're sending like social cost it's sort of the you know, the, the, the first entry of, of sending the right price signals, I think we're going to get the right result uh, and not, uh, you know, waste important assets like this giant set of pipes that can, that can help us decarbonize. I'd also like to uh, point out one of the other technologies that I'm very interested in, it's being piloted in uh, Massachusetts right now, is use heat technologies, H-E-E-T. And this is like neighborhood scale, uh, heat pump technology. So rather than doing it on an individual uh, home or uh, an apartment, this is a whole neighborhood and the, it's it's like utility grade heat pump technology. And this is one of the things I'm very interested in seeing, you know, is, is this something that, um, that we can explore here in Colorado? Great. Thank you both so much for those uh, perspectives and insights. And, and, and Chris, it's really great to hear the way that you think about that. Uh, perpetuation argument. I think that brings a lot of clarity, makes a lot of sense, and, and, and really gets us focused on decarbonization as the goal, as well as utilization of assets and infrastructure that we have available to achieve that goal. The, the last bill I want to talk about of yours before we um, have a closing question and then wrap into the uh, Q&A is the public uh, projects bill, Global Warming Potential for Public Project Materials. HB 21-1303, because it's not only electricity and gas emissions and agricultural emissions and industrial emissions that we need to address, but also, you know, what about the materials that are used during construction, those embedded, uh, that embedded carbon? Um, can you tell me a little bit about this bill and why it's important not to lose sight of 
those emissions that are so easily overlooked. Well, again, I have to give a shout out to Senator Hansen because this idea was something that uh, he introduced in uh, 2020. And because of COVID, it didn't quite get over the finish line. Um, but as a civil engineer by background, uh, boy, was I interested in this bill. And I just have to say my, my favorite memory of this bill was there I was uh, on the House floor uh, addressing all my colleagues at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night, and I was talking about concrete. And thinking, oh my gosh, who the heck cares about concrete? So I'll give you two reasons. The so first of all, concrete, the, the processes used to manufacture concrete and steel represent 14% of the total worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. And if cement, which is that glue in concrete, for a nation, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world, the third largest country in the world. That's why you care about this. And so uh, this bill um, directs the um, state architect and the Department of Transportation to develop policies that lower the greenhouse gas emissions used or to basically to develop greener um to uh use greener um construction materials in state funded buildings and in transportation just think for a minute how much um concrete steel asphalt are used just in transportation but this also includes wood and uh and glass and it, it's uh the most comprehensive one in the nation in terms of uh, the breadth and the scope uh, and uh, and I'm just really excited about it. this is um, it's using things called environmental product decorations, which are kind of like a nutrition label to um, the lower the EPD, then the lower the greenhouse gas emissions that are used to create these these uh, materials. But the exciting thing is there's many, many different ways that you can reduce um, the uh, embodied carbon in these uh, in these um, uh, uh, products. You can use different manufacturing processes, even some that sequester carbon. Uh, you can use different raw materials uh, and, and also recycled materials. Uh, different and, and, and the way those materials react can uh, can uh, also uh, either you know you can use less cement to bind the products or uh, they just themselves they have uh, they sequester carbon and also you can use green energy to power those industrial processes we've talked about renewable energy but also uh, Senator Hansen talked about hydrogen so these are all things that we can do it's uh, on the transport a lot of architects understand. Um, this whole idea of uh, embodied carbon, and so uh, they really get it. But uh, I kept telling the stakeholders in the transportation industries, uh, we are building the airplane as it's taking off. And but um, they're really getting on board very quickly. It was um, I'm I'm really um, pleased at, at the amount of response I've gotten from manufacturers and from um, uh, you know just many stakeholders and and uh, and other. Um, other states around the country uh, asking about this. So, <laughs> yeah, I would, I would thank just you for that. that. I, I think there's a huge potential here, and you know, we started this off with I think a, a comprehensive bill for how we spend state money. That's what we have direct control over. Um, but we're going to have to, you know, quickly figure out how to to create the right market demand and, and market pull in the private sector and. Uh, that is something we're starting to think about for next session, uh, perhaps using things like, uh, you know, sales tax incentives on low emission or zero emission products uh, is another way to really accelerate the adoption of, of these products in, in private construction. And, and I just have to say one more thing. I get this question all the time. Well, what about cost? Um, there's been uh, uh, studies done that um, you can reduce the, um, the, the embodied carbon in construction materials by 30 to 50 percent with z basically no increase in cost so this is very doable it's just it, it's just what we're trying to do is really change the thinking change the way people think about producing these materials and i think it's a fabulous opportunity to really decarbonize 
uh, a very hard uh, market to do harmonize. <laughs> well, you know, one that hasn't been, I, let me say, it, it's one that hasn't been thought about. So it's a great opportunity. Oh, absolutely. And, and this one is exciting for me as a city employee to try to encourage our leadership and our you know, Department of Transportation and Infrastructure that are using so many of these materials to say, hey, can is this a framework that we can also adopt and trying to get more local governments to follow in the state's footsteps who are really the ones you know, investing a lot of money in these uh, public projects where we might be able to make a big difference. All right, so as we're transitioning into the Q&A here, I do want to acknowledge uh, so many other clean energy bills that were passed this session. Uh, remarkably, we've only just scratched the surface tonight in terms of our conversation. There's Senate Bill 261, encouraging renewable energy generation, 246, promoting beneficial electrification, 1286, uh, energy performance for buildings, 260, uh, sustainability of the transportation sector, 1269, a study of community choice energy, and I'm sure several others uh, not on that list. Uh, was there anything that really stood out to you both as particularly impactful or complementary uh, to the bills that you sponsored? Go ahead, Chris, you can start. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I I think we, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, we tried to really move move the ball, move forward on all these different sectors, uh, and and try to you know turn over some of the stones that had been and left alone. And and frankly, like the clean uh, uh, construction materials piece, that was totally left out of the governor's roadmap. Um, I mean, there were just some blind spots, I think, in the way that uh, some of the policy was being discussed. And we tried our best to to find those blind spots, address them in a, in a meaningful way. And set ourselves up for future success and in, in you know those those different topics. So uh, I think ag sector uh, you know is 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 in a similar place. Uh, is largely exempted from previous action, uh, not really part of the governor's roadmap, and a place where we can make a, a huge amount of progress and and do it in a way that really helps rural constituencies. So I I guess I see this as uh, you know it's sort of a, a relay race. Uh, Tracy and I have the baton right now, along with our colleagues. We are running as hard and as fast as we can, um, and we're gonna, you know, just keep keep pushing and and building on the previous progress. Um, but I, I think that's that's what we did in 2021. Is is we really uh, kind of you know to continue the running metaphor, we had had runners on every lane, uh, so to speak, in each of these different sectors, and and now we just keep keep uh, racing forward. Yeah, um, thank you, Senator Hansen. I do have to add one more bill to this because I think this is really important for renewable energy um, advocates like everybody in the audience. And that is a bill that started in the Senate with Senator Hansen, and it was a stimulus bill, uh, Senate Bill uh, 230. This is uh, a $40 million stimulus bill of which um, $30 million goes toward uh, funding the Green Bank. And this, I'm particularly excited about, this This Green Bank lever can leverage five to 10 times as much in private capital to fund uh, all sorts of renewable energy uh, projects. And what I really like is uh, some, of the, some of these projects are really hard to fund. I, I remember talking to um, a solar installer who really wanted to do uh, an HOA installment, but it was too big for a mortgage, too small for a bank to be interested in. Perfect for the green bank to get involved in that. So I just had to put a shout out for that one. Yeah, thank you for that one. I forgot about Senate Bill 230. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a testament to how much good work you both did and, and your colleagues as well this past session. So I'm going to open it up now for questions. And we have some that are already uh, dropped into the question pane. Um, anyone attending, uh, you can feel free to uh, ask your questions there. I'm going to start at the top of the list and, and work my way down. And I'll ask folks to unmute to ask their question directly. So the first is from David Alley. So I have unmuted you as the organizer. You're now self-muted. So if you want to unmute yourself, you should be able to ask your question, David. All right, David, you've had five seconds, which means I'm going to take over and ask it for you. Sorry. Um, 
can the PUC be required to explore and potentially implement a progressive income-based approach to utility rates? Ah, uh, that's a that's a great one. Um, the answer is maybe, but it's difficult. Um, you know, the the rates, um, you know, the the rate structures have to be fairly, uh, you know, uniform across different types of customers. Uh, that don't have direct uh, relationship to income. But one of the bills we didn't talk about tonight, which I think uh, is very relevant, is a bill I did with Chris Kennedy uh, to create a much larger funding mechanism for uh, low-income customers to help with utility bills and energy efficiency. And uh, we're going to be putting, you know, a significant increase, it's about 30 billion, 30 million, excuse me, a year of additional money for low low-income customers in the state that come from uh, a small uh, fee or surcharge on everybody's uh, utility bills to help those customers. So in a sense, we have done that, but we didn't do it with a rate structure. We did it with uh, a small surcharge to help low-income customers both afford their energy, but also, more importantly, uh, uh, increase their efficiency and, and ability to do renewable projects uh, at the house level. So that, that was one we didn't talk about tonight, uh, but I think it gets to the heart of the question um, and so the short answer is very tough to do it with rate structure, but we have, I think, done some really significant uh, positive changes on uh, the, you know, the Energy Outreach Colorado and, and low income programs in the state. And, and I have to say my gas demand side management uh, program, this, this is using an existing tool that the TUC has, but I uh, put into statute that 25% of the residential um, uh, program expenditures have to go toward income qualified uh, customers. And so this is, again, this is using existing tools, but um, I, I feel so strongly that we need to bring everybody along on the sustainable infrastructure of the future. And so I was really proud to put that in, in statute this, this, uh, this year. All right, thank you, David, very much for the question. Uh, next one is from Theron Makeley. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yes, yeah, please proceed. Thanks for all you're doing on these bills. It's been incredible the last few years watching uh, the progress here, and it's really leading edge across the whole country. But uh, I've been involved with the AQCC a little bit and um, actually sat on the, the commission call on Friday for most of the day. And um, it's got to be frustrating to see how ineffective they've been in mandating the rules around the greenhouse gas emissions. And... Um, I know you guys can't do much about the, you know, the governor's office and that side of the ha of the of the government, but what can you do as a legislator to make sure that the AQC and the governor's office are enforcing these bold actions that you guys are asking to take? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that has been an active discussion and will continue to be so because I think there is uh, some some frustration there. I certainly have felt it, like like you have expressed. Um, one of the things that that I've been seriously looking at and talking to colleagues about is is professionalizing AQCC. Not that you know our commissioners are are bad in any way, but they are part time, and there is not adequate bandwidth at the commission like we have just done at the PUC to I think really professionalize this work and and do it in a more methodical and and uh, rapid way. And so I I would love to see us move toward a, a more professional commission. Uh, one that is uh, a bit more insulated, like the PUC, from uh, you know from the day-to-day -day, uh, politics, and so that I think is the model that we've had some good success with with uh, the Utility Commission, and I think could uh, could help us uh, do a better job at the AQCC. Uh, I'm just going to say that this is new, this whole issue is near and dear to my heart, um, and it's very personal for me. So um, that's as much as I'm going to say about it at this point in time. Thank you, and thank you, Saren, very much for the question. Uh, the next one we have is from Nick Thornburg. So Nick, I'll give you a couple seconds here if you can unmute yourself. Otherwise, I will ask your question for you. Uh, hi, Nick, are everyone. you there? Looks like it. Great. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great. Uh, so I was going to ask, what, if anything, is being done to curb 
nitrous oxide emissions. That would be N2O. It's nearly 300 times more potent than CO2 and lasts in the atmosphere uh, about four times as long. Uh, agriculture is a primary source of N2O from soil nitrification cycles, uh, but it's a very difficult one to regulate. And to my knowledge, there are no state level regulations at this point. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, this is a great question. Um, I mean, this is certainly, uh, I think, part of uh, part of the research, part of the thinking going into an ag sector bill for this year. Uh, you're absolutely right. Right now, there is little to no uh, regulation or requirements on some of these other very powerful pollutants, um, and that's something we'd want to put front and center as we as we put together an ag sector bill. I will say for for folks on the line, if any of you read the Economist, they actually did an article on exactly what you are describing. Uh, and they're experimenting right now in Europe with, uh, if I can use the term, potty training their cows uh, to both urinate and defecate in a kind of cow toilet so they can capture all of this uh, and mitigate uh, some of the pollution effects like the nitrous oxide. So uh, who knows? We may have uh, you know cow toilets in Colorado soon if those experiments go well in Europe. I don't think I need to say anything more on this. <laughs> But thank you. I really appreciate uh, piquing my interest on this. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much for, for that question. Uh, next up, we have a question from uh, Martin Volker. So Martin, I've just unmuted you. You should be able to unmute yourself. Maybe. There you go, Martin. I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, very well. Uh, so my, my question is, uh, you mentioned uh, the heating sector, and I uh, I just want to emphasize how important education is on that front, because and was going to ask what are you planning in uh, about educating people. Uh, the reason that is so important is uh, most people only ever replace their heating system if it catastrophically fails. That's 95% of all replacements. In that situation, what's happening is they just install whatever is at hand. And that will typically be a gas furnace because all of these heat pumps, I have one, are special order. <laughs> and if you don't know about it ahead of time and plan for that day to come and replace your unit ahead of the catastrophic failure, you're going to end up with a fossil fuel furnace. Thank you. I'm, I'm so glad you answered that. This is some of the discussions that are going on right now, how uh, you, you hit the nail on head. It's not just the education of the individual homeowners, but it's also the contractors who are involved in heating and uh, in, in air conditioning. That um, there's, this is, you know, heat pump technology has been around forever in Europe. They, they wonder what the heck is going on in the United States. But there's a lot of contractors who that, that need to be trained on this. This is something I've also talked to labor about. You need to do, continue to develop apprenticeship programs that really train um, train contractors on on, uh, on, on heat pump technology. So, um, and I'm so glad you brought up the whole, uh, the thing that, you know, your furnace goes out and it's an emergency situation. So um, I've been having discussions about what planned heat, you know, how do we plan for these things? And and uh, if, if your uh, furnace reaches a, you know, a certain age, that maybe you can uh, encourage and educate people to um, to uh, not wait until there's a disaster, but plan it ahead of time. So thank you. There's certainly are a lot of discussions on this. Thank you, Martin. Uh, the next question we have is from Ron Larson. Thanks, Johnny, and a representative and senators. Thanks uh, for being here tonight. It was a very good program. Uh, COP26 is coming up in about five or six weeks. And my understanding is there's going to be a great deal of discussion on carbon negativity. We're 50% over previous carbon dioxide levels. We have to start taking it out. I'm wondering what you see happening in Colorado. Over. Yeah, I, it's a really important point. I mean, I, I think I've been following closely, you know, things like direct air capture technology, um, 
I think there are a number of uh, carbon negative activities that that are are uh, you know of course lots of research. Um, and I, I would say right now we just don't have the right price signals uh, to to really drive some of that some of that investment. And that's something I'd, I'd really like to change. I think part of my hope with an ag sector decarbonization bill is that we get some better price signals for offsets, that we get uh, uh, things that are complementary to some of the federal policies that are in place and uh, in motion in some of the reconciliation bills uh, to really put Colorado at the forefront of, of that negative carbon emission work. Um, and I think if, if we get those things right on the policy side, uh, the private sector will respond in a really uh, strong way. And, and Colorado is a great place uh, you know, to, to try to attract that investment. I'd also have to add that I think soil health is such an important part of that. That can actually, um, by improving soil health, we can sequester carbon. And uh, this last year, we did actually fund a voluntary soil health program, but that's just a start. We really need to educate and um, this is another area that I'm, I'm very interested in because I couldn't agree with you more. We have to do more than be carbon neutral. We have to go negative. And uh, one of the one of the interesting things I'm kind of looking at right now is, is, is things like bi biochar is being uh, another way to sequester carbon. Uh, so these are active discussions I'm having right now. All right, thank you. And we're, we're getting close to our uh, kind of wrap up time here. Um, want to be respectful of uh, Representative Burnett and Senator Hansen's time. So if, I think we're just going to do three more questions, uh, if that's all right with you both. And then we will wrap things up and thank our guests. So Ron Bennett, you are next and you should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, thank you. Hello, Representative Burnett and Senator Hansen. Thank you for your climate leadership. Um, I'm an architect and I, I'm working really hard right now to build all electric buildings, a number of them, as a matter of fact. We've actually redesigned uh, buildings that have been approved that had gas connections and we've redesigned them to be all electric. So Senator Hansen, I'd, I'd like to challenge you a bit on your um, assertion that we should continue to use uh, frac gas infrastructure. If you said uh, we should utilize the billions of dollars worth of um, existing distribution infrastructure that we have. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we know that the methane leaks from that infrastructure are 84 times more potent than CO2 on a 20 year horizon. So are we going to accept these leaks and their climate impacts, or are we going to invest more money? to tighten up that infrastructure, all the way from the well to the furnace. And if it's the latter, wouldn't those funds be better spent on true electrification efforts, renewable generation and storage, the kind of power sources that my buildings that I'm building today will use long into the future? Thanks, thanks again for everything. Yeah. But I, I feel like your question mischaracterized my remarks pretty in a pretty important way, which my remarks were really about using this infrastructure to transport green fuels like ammonia and hydrogen. Um, and so, yeah, we need to tighten up methane leaks in our current system, of course, and we've got different mechanisms we have in place, both regulatory uh, and otherwise to do that. But the, my remarks are really just about trying to uh, utilize assets that we have if it makes sense on the hydrogen and ammonia side. So I'm, I'm glad you're working on electric buildings. That's fantastic. Let's not uh, continue to build buildings that rely on fossil fuels. Sounds great. Uh, but there are gonna be some applications, especially industrial heat applications where we're gonna need hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, or ammonia mix. Uh, and we might as well use the pipes we've already paid for. So that's that was what I was trying, the point I was trying to make earlier. <clears throat> Thank you for the question and, and for the clarification and response. Uh, the next one we have here is from uh, David Takahashi. Yes. Am I on? Yes. Okay. So um, when, uh, thank you both, um, when may we look forward to a smart grid? that sends those price signals to rate payers so we can avoid the price surges 
due to fossil price fluctuations. Yeah, well, I take that one. Um, yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy to take that one on. I think that is one of the key components of moving to regional and, and eventually to, to a more intercontinental uh, wholesale markets and, and RTOs. Um, you know, there was a price spike because of what happened in Texas uh, and, the, and the, the, the winter storm, winter storm URI. Um, and we are subject to price volatility in fossil fuel markets that uh, we need to obviously eliminate as fast as we can. And one of the best ways to do that is have integrated RTO. So when that day is going to be here, I, I wish I could predict. What I did do uh, with Senate Bill 72 was to put a clear deadline and so that they we're not wasting any more time. Um, I feel like our current utilities have really uh, avoided this topic. Uh, and I and I sort of understand why. They, they are, in a sense, um, they make more money when they can kind of have their own fiefdom, uh, which is what we have in the Western U.S. right now. There's 37 separate grids. It makes no sense for the customer. It makes no sense for the environment. And so moving more rapidly to regionalization of grids and then eventually to stitching those together, I think is, is one of the really important aspects of, of solving this decarbonization puzzle. Um, Colorado, by statute, will be in that no later than 2030. I actually think we'll get there a little bit earlier. Um, when we have a smart grid uh, you know, that does all the things we, we need it to do, I, I don't know the date. Um, the good news is, we're going to keep working hard on on these grid issues so that we can get uh, the you know the emission reductions that we that uh, result. All right, thank you. And <clears throat> the last question here is from uh, Thomas Lundy. Thomas, are you out there? Looking like it? Yes. You're still muted. There, can you hear me now? Yeah. There I mean, we I've, go. I've just been hearing talk about introducing a bill in the legislature to refer a ballot measure to mandate elected AQCC and COGC commissioners as a way to sidestep some of the problems we've been having with appoint, you know, commissioners appointed by the governor. The problems in the, you know, we've discussed AQCC problems. Of course, there's the big scandal about testing earlier this year. Right now, the COGCC is allowing um, a flood of permits coming in while the uh, required 700 series rulemaking, which is about um, you know funding cleanup, essentially, that's required by SB uh, 19181 is not going on. And Governor Polis, I believe was in Steamboat, said earlier that he was uncomfortable giving a lot of power to non-elected commissioners. So what would you say if, you know, some sort of legislation like that were brought up to you? Oh, boy. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'll have to say that I'm studying that whole issue. And uh, that's, I, I'm, I'm studying that issue. I would just uh, ask for your consideration to look at uh, the differences between elected and non-elected PUCs around the country. Uh, elected PUCs have typically been much less effective than non-elected PUCs. Uh, I think we have benefited from that in Colorado. So I think that's a pretty significant change and one that is not very well supported by the research on public utility commissions. Um, I think there are ways that the legislature now uh, has the ability to, to step up as your elected representatives and, and uh, hold those commissions more accountable. Um, as you heard me mention earlier, I think one option we need to look at is to professionalize the AQCC like we have done with the PUC uh, as one of the reform measures that we can look at uh, to, to get faster and, and more accountability, faster action and more accountability. Uh, but I would say, based on what I know about elected PUCs around the country, I'd be pretty hesitant to go that direction. And I'd just like to clarify the whole the whole issue. Um, I'm, I'm still learning. You know, I'm a new legislator and understanding more about what the CDPAT does, what the AQCC does, COGCC. These are things that I'm that I'm I'm getting up to speed on. Great. Well, thank you everybody uh, for being so engaged and for your uh, thoughtful questions, and of course to our uh, to. Uh, guest tonight um, for just sharing so much with us and for all the work that you're doing at the legislature. 
So kind of the closing question for you before you go is really, you know, what comes next? And uh, if you want to, in, in what way are you most optimistic about Colorado's climate future? Well, I'm, I'm heavily optimistic. Uh, I, I think, you know, we've got a great foundation to build on. I think we can make rapid progress in the remaining sectors. Uh, I think we can start sending uh, much stronger price signals uh, to the market uh, that's going to help us decarbonize uh, tough sectors even faster. So I, I see great days ahead. Um, I, you know, I think where we are in the climate crisis is scary, uh, but I think we've we've got to stay focused and and uh, on on the work that we can do. And um, just appreciate being part of the conversation tonight, Johnny. So thanks for for the invitation. Now, I did not collaborate with Senator Hansen beforehand on this question, but I'm also very optimistic. I think we're really on a roll. Um, I'm so excited about how Colorado is really leading the nation. So the things, the way things work is that when you have uh, legislators exchange ideas all across the country, and this, and Colorado is really a leader in a lot of the ways, and this influences not only other states but also the federal federal government. I'd also have to say that I'll tell you, climate change with the wildfires we've had this summer, climate change is really big on voters' minds right now. So I think that there's a lot of wind in our sails to really make a difference, both here at the state and also at the federal level. So I am very optimistic, but we don't have time. We have to do things now. It is a crisis. We are living through a changing climate right now. And that includes not only decarbonizing, but we also have to look at resiliency as well, not just in the grid, but in many other ways, um, floods and wildfires and all sorts of other things. So we need to do an all of above. But I'm, I'm hopeful because I think people are finally realizing we don't have time. And I'll just wrap it up by saying that it gives me hope that we have people like you in our state legislature, legislature working on these problems every day. And so thank you so much for all the work that you're doing and for being here uh, with us for this uh, conversation. It's been a lot of fun talking with you. Thanks everyone who came tonight uh, for this event. And I encourage you to come back to our upcoming events. Um, as a reminder, next uh, Thursday, October 21st, we've got our ESG panel, so we'll learn a little bit about you know what's going on in corporate America and the finance world in terms of putting environmental, social, and governance issues at the center of some of their decision making. And then we'll kick it over to the federal level on Thursday, November 18th, learning about Biden's infrastructure plan. So this is a pretty great three-part series. I think was somewhat unintentional hearing about all the great work being done at the at uh, state level, as well as uh, corporate and finance, and then uh, looking federally. And we really need all of these uh, pointing in the same direction if we're ultimately going to be successful. So thank you all again. Have a great night, and please do come back to our future events.